Welcome to the Ham Radio Money Show, where I'll try and answer an age-old question. Should you spend more money on your transceiver or your antenna? The answer may not be quite straightforward as you might think. It's also the wrong question. More important is how well you spend the money that you've got. There's a widespread view that you get what you pay for. That is, the more you spend, the more you get. But is it necessarily the more benefit you get? It's an important distinction, and there's two main reasons why. The first of all is the law of diminishing returns. Very often, as you spend more, the effectiveness of each additional dollar drops off. That is, an extra dollar spent when you've already spent a lot is less effective and gives you less improvement to your station than an extra dollar spent when you've only spent less. But even if you don't believe that, there's some other factors at play. Up here, your XYL might walk out, and that might initially be good, you've got more time to be on the air and get more contacts. But then, you might require even more expenditure on your station, and you take on a second job. Then, your activity plummets, because you've got no time to be on the radio. Where's the benefit in that? The other reason why you get what you pay doesn't always work is there is such a thing as good and bad radio expenditure. I'll define good spending as whatever makes you a stronger signal at the other end or helps you receive signals better. Bad spending is whatever doesn't do those things, but it could still involve a significant amount of money. Uppermost in your mind should be the search for value. Keep thinking about it, whether you're browsing eBay, having a wander down a ham fest aisle, or visiting your nearest ham radio shop. The search for value will help clarify decisions in your mind as to what you should buy and what maybe isn't worth it. Different people with different interests have different perceptions of values. That's fine, but you need to base your decisions on what you want Amateur Radio to do for you. It's helpful to draw up a list of what's good and bad value in both antennas and transceivers. Picking the best from this list will give you a good value station, regardless of whether you spend most of it on transceivers or antennas. Starting off with transceivers, and the good value column is fairly short. A basic 100 watt multiband HF rig will give you more contacts than you have time in the day to operate it. Secondly, if your budget is a bit less, you might want to consider a frequency agile QRP rig. It needs to be on one or more popular bands that are open during all of the solar cycle. 40 metres is a good choice, as well as 20 metres, if you want to work DX. It should be CW and or SSB. Power output should be at least 2 watts, and preferably more, to ensure contacts at all times of the day. Next on the list, some sort of VHF UHF mobile transceiver. Unlike a handheld, where you may need to buy extra accessories, like external microphones, speakers, etc., all that is included in the box with the mobile transceiver. It also puts out 20 to 50 watts output power, useful for hitting distant repeaters, or longer distance contacts on simplex. Then, because of its low price, I've included a VHF UHF handheld transceiver, although that's mainly in the big cities where there's plenty of activity and repeaters. The poor value list is longer. Items that get on it are poor value because they are either cheap and don't give you very good results, or they're really expensive and you can get almost as good results for a lot less. An example of the first is the $10 cheapy CW transceiver kits you see on eBay. Crystal controlled, a couple of hundred milliwatts output, and a terrible receiver. You don't want one of those unless your main aim is to build the kit and possibly make pre-arranged contacts with local hams. Then there's the top of the line HF transceivers, the flagship models in most manufacturers offerings. It's not going to be any more powerful than your entry level 100 watt rig on transmit. Its receive will be better, but unless you're an ardent DXer 
the extra capability probably won't give you that many more contacts compared to if you're using a basic rig. The difference between them and a cheaper rig will be several thousand dollars, which you'd almost certainly be better off on spending on antennas, which we'll discuss later on. Moving on down, we have QRP rigs that cost more than 100 watt transceivers. Why? Where's the value for that? The only value I can see is if the QRP rig is smaller, lighter and more portable. Moving down market, there are also QRP rigs from unknown manufacturers with poor reliability records. Look at the reviews before buying, it can be a bit hit and miss. Some single band rigs can also be expensive. For instance, there's a whole lot of 28 MHz mono band rigs that might be great during the top of the sunspot cycle, but at other times you're mostly just hearing noise. Also on my poor value list, not because of the price, which is very low, but because you probably won't get much use out of them, are VHF UHF handhelds, particularly in remote areas with no repeaters or little activity. Expensive software-defined radios are another one. They seem to depreciate more than standalone transceivers, so they might not be the best value for money. And then there's vintage gear that seems to attract a cult following. That's fine if you're willing to spend as much time tinkering as operating, or you picked up a transceiver that was not fashionable and quite cheap. First on the list is wire, even if it's salvaged speaker cable. Because wire antennas are some of the best value projects in amateur radio today. Secondly is open wire feed line. You might be able to find it commercially, but it's also cheap and fairly easy to build it yourself. Height is really important as well. If you can increase your dipole by 5 metres, let's say going from 8 metres to 13 metres, then you are going to get a very big increase in performance. Noise will be less, your angle of radiation will be lower, and you'll find DX easier to work. Whether it be timber or aluminium, spending two or three hundred dollars on material to increase your antenna's height is great value for money. Another thing I'd recommend is some sort of antenna coupler. For single-ended antennas, it could be an L, Pi or T network or a balance coupler if you're going to be using open wire feed line. That's desirable if you want to get several bands out of a single wire dipole antenna. Building your own antenna coupler is easy. It only requires a few parts, although you may need to hunt for them, especially the variable capacitors. As for the antennas themselves, well, simple dipoles, loops, verticals and end feds or qualify as good value for money antennas, especially if you build them yourself. If you want the ultimate in performance, then wire beams, either horizontal or vertically polarised, are another thing to consider. You may not be able to rotate them, but ingenious switching mechanisms can allow instant direction reversal or change. And on VHF, where the antennas are smaller, small beams are also something I'd recommend four or five elements, doesn't use a lot of material, yet effectively increases your signal by about 10 times relative to a simple antenna such as a ground plane. Then there's low loss coax. Note that on HF, really expensive coax is overkill, except for very long runs. But on VHF and UHF, it becomes critical. Lossy cable can easily gobble up half, if not more, of your signal. Back to getting the antenna up high, extendable fishing poles are also excellent value for money. $40 or $50 might get you an 8 or 9 metre pole. That's ideal for portable operating or even temporary operating from home. On VHF, you could use an extendable fishing pole to mount a ground plane high up in the clear. That will give as good performance as a beam antenna at a much lower height. In our bad value column are items that may add to convenience but not necessarily the strength of your signal at the other end. First up are automatic antenna couplers. They cost a fortune yet give no better performance than a manual coupler. 
I've seen cases of expensive automatic couplers unable to match antennas that a simple homebrew manually adjusted L-match can match with ease. Another thing you want to be wary of are very small commercially made antennas. Also be wary of very small commercially made antennas. They are products in the market to solve a problem and for that the manufacturer charges a premium. There are some cases where you can only use those antennas but if you're outdoors and plenty of room then a homemade wire antenna can perform just as well. Not unrelated are complex portable antennas with lots of bits and pieces. Just right to go missing when you're portable and that can be really frustrating. Another thing you want to consider is the value of expensive beams. This is spoken about a lot in Les Moxon's book, HF Antennas for All Locations. It may be that a two element beam on a mast that's 15 metres tall is a better performer than a three element trapped beam on a much smaller mast, say only seven or eight metres tall. Think about the trade-offs with things like antenna size and height and your answers may be different. Even a high dipole can be a good performer and you may be better off spending some money on a mast that puts your antenna up in the clear. Last on our list are antennas that claim broadband HF operation, particularly without a coupler or open wire feed line. There's likely to be compromises and if a commercial product you're going to be paying dearly for them. The same goes for ultra compact antennas. There are three items I put down as being of variable value. They're good for some people but not for others. Balans is one. A ballon in the middle of a half wave dipole is unlikely to produce a noticeable improvement in performance, especially for QRP portable work. Then there's ununs or unbalanced to unbalanced. Some people use 9 to 1 ratio types to provide an impedance transformation between the 50 ohm feed line and a high impedance long wire antenna. Personally, I regard that as a compromise. Your load is likely to be reactive and of varying impedances, and you're better off to use a variable antenna coupler such as an L match. Next on the list are commercially made dipoles and end feds. A commercially made antenna may be a bit better finished than one you made yourself. And if you're time poor and money rich, then it's not necessarily a bad option. You are paying a bit of money for just a bit of wire, but at least you know its performance will be reasonably good, compared with other antennas that are much more expensive, smaller and perform a lot worse. And finally, and I regard this as a nice to have, antenna analyzers. They can range up to hundreds of dollars, if not more. They're good if you do a lot of experimenting with antennas, but otherwise, if you're mainly an operator and just want something efficient to put up, then you can get away without one. In this video, I've spoken about the search for value. There's no one easy answer between whether you should spend most of your money on your equipment or on your antennas. Consider what you want from amateur radio and weigh up what you consider is good and bad value for money when you spend your money on your hobby.